Now this morning we have a word from the Lord, so just be prepared to listen. This is a good thing. In the last month, I've been receiving a lot of things from the Lord, very specific things. And some things I've been praying about for a long time, but I'll tell you what, he's dropped something on my heart. This is, this is not a new word, but it's a fresh word. So listen to the Spirit of the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that the word today comes out with power. I pray, Lord God, that everything that's said and all that's done would give you glory. Use me, Father, my mind and my will, my emotions. Let it be all of you and none of me. And I just give you praise for what's going to happen here today. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles this morning to Philippians chapter 4. Praise God. Philippians 4 and start in verse 6. Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Some people have read this before, but today I want you to see it. Philippians 4 and verse 6 starts like this. It says, be anxious for nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. This is a promise of God. He said very clearly, don't worry about a thing. Don't worry about a thing. This should be something we should hang on to because of all the things that Christians do that separates them from all the world, it's not worry. We worry as much as the world does. We consider things that are going to happen that haven't happened yet. We ponder on stuff that gives us a big problem. And the Lord said, don't worry, don't worry. It says to give... Give prayer with supplication. Now some people ask, okay, what's the difference between prayer and supplication? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> supplication means to cry out to God, to bend your knees down to God, earnestly seeking help from God, and doing it by faith with thanksgiving because you know he's going to handle it. This is where your heart is a whole bunch different, which is different from the world because they're not sure it's going to get handled at all. But God says, I will handle this. Then he says, let your request be made known unto me. Let it be made known unto God. Then the peace of God will be your security system. Sure. You don't need to go into an alarm state if you're in peace. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's God's plan. Now, if you can hold your peace in tough times, that's what God wants you to do. As you go through life, peace is there to guard your heart and mind. It's his promise. Look at Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Proverbs 4 and 23 says it like this. Above all else, guard your heart. Above all else, for everything that you do will flow from it. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Now, I don't mean guard your heart. In other words, put it away into a little box or hide it inside of some kind of a cave. Don't let anybody get near it. It's not supposed to be open for anybody. We sometimes close off our heart, and it's not the same. The word guard here, when it says guard your heart, is very clear that we're not supposed to hide it or seal it off. But according to the Hebrew word guard, it means to watch over it. You can't watch over it if it's in a closet. You can't watch over it if it's in a cave. It says to watch over it, to protect it, to keep it, to shield it. Amen. Many times we lock off our heart from people. We lock off our heart from situations. We lock off our heart from circumstances. But the Lord says we're supposed to protect it, not lock it off. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 4, again in verse 20 through 23, it says it like this. It says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Hide them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those that find them and help to all their flesh. And then he says, keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it springs the issues of life. He says, this is what I want you to do. Now, everything we're to do, it needs to be filtered 
It needs to be filtered. All decisions, all circumstances, they need to be filtered. All thoughts, all responses need to be filtered by the Word of God. The Word of God should be your filter. Everything goes through the Word. Then you won't worry. So today, listen to me. What we're going to talk about for a little while is don't drop your guard. Don't drop your guard. Don't drop your guard. Look in Luke chapter 8. I want you to see this. It starts in verse 22. Luke chapter 8. And I'm going to read this from the Passion Translation. It says it like this. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's get into a boat and go across the other side of the lake. So they set sail. And soon Jesus fell asleep. In other translations it says in the back or the hinder part of the boat. And he fell asleep. And the wind rose. And the fierce winds became a violent squall that threatened to swamp their boat. That's very descriptive. So the disciples went and woke up Jesus. They said, Master, 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 don't you care that we're going to drown? Don't you care? Don't you care? Don't you care? And with great authority, Jesus rebuked the howling and the surging waves, and instantly they stopped. And they became smooth like glass. And Jesus said to them, Why are you fearful? Have you lost your faith in me? And shocked and shaken, they said with amazement to one another, Who is this man? Who is this man? And another translation says, What manner of man is this? That he has the authority over the winds and the waves and they obey him. What, what manner of man is this? And I, I think it's very curious to say it like this. They did not know who they had with him. They didn't know who was in the boat. They didn't know who they had on board. Let me ask you a question. Do you know who's on board with you during the storm? See, I think some people don't recognize that we've got Jesus right with us. In other words, I'm saying this. He said to them, I want you to understand. Because they said, what manner of man is this? In other words, he said, don't drop your guard. Don't drop your guard. Amen. Now, when I went to college, I enjoyed college dearly. College was a good time. And I went to college, and in the first few days, they took me down to the, to the boxing part of the college campus. And I watched the boxer, boxers box, and I said, you know... I, I like watching boxing with my grandpa sit on his knee, you know, and he'd move me around when he's, because he, he'd move and punch when the people were punching, and I, I'd do the same thing, so I was going to be a boxer. And, you know, I lettered in wrestling in high school. It's a natural progression. You just go into boxing, you know. It's, it's very good for your aerobics, and it, it's just a good thing. So I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out for the boxing team. I went in there, you know, got them little shorts, you know, and got the little jersey, and I got the headgear, you know, and a, a little mouth guard, you know, and, and they fit me for gloves, and, and I got to thinking, I'm going to have to hit somebody with this, and sure enough, they decided to give me a sparring partner. They put me in there, and the sparring partner hit me and hit me, and, and the coach yelled from the sideline, don't drop your guard, <laughs> and it, I didn't even know what a guard was. <laughs> and so and they said, you know, you've got to put up your dukes. I didn't even know what dukes were. So, so I grabbed my hands and put them up like this, and guys were punching me, and my hands were backing into my face. I, don't, I was beating myself up, you know, <laughs> and they'd hit me a few more times. And, 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 and finally I tried to do it, but, you know, I, 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 for whatever reason, they kept coming down, and, and they'd yell from the sideline, coach say, don't drop your guard. And I'd lift my hand up and again, and, and pretty soon they'd give me other sparring partners, other sparring partners and some were pretty light and you know just kind of tapped my gloves and some were just you know kind of rocking back and forth with me and I, I thought I'd learn into box and you know, got to my first match they put me in the ring and you know I, I did all the proper bouncing you're supposed to do you know and I jogged around a little bit and I stood in the corner and had the right, you know, shorts on and shiny red ones, you know, and I was, I was looking real good. I had my big old white tennis shoes on and looking real good, had the headgear on and, and got out there in the match and, and the coach yelled from the sideline, don't drop your guard. I hadn't started yet. <laughs> what kind of confidence is that? <laughs> and I got out there and put my gloves up, you know, and sure enough, the guy went over the top of my gloves because they weren't high enough and he hit me in the face a few times and... 
And man, it stunned me. This is not anything like my sparring partner. Anxiety set in. Remorse set in. I had a whole three rounds to go with this guy. We hadn't finished the first one. <laughs> He's going to bust me up. And so I put my hands up there, like, but they were shaking, you know. And, 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 and the coach yelling from the side, don't drop your guard. And, I, and finally, you know, they called it at one time because I was staggering so much. And I went over there and I, I said, as a coach, I said, there's a problem. He said, what's that? I said, there's a whole bunch of them. He said, hit the one in the middle. <laughs> And, and I, I kept trying, you know, and then he yelled from the sideline, don't drop your guard. And, and I found out something when the match was over. I like watching boxing. <laughs> I was done with the boxing match. That's it. That's it. Because I realized something. There, this is a tougher sport than I ever thought it was. People get hurt. I never got hurt in wrestling. They didn't go for my face with their fist. I, 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 I never recognized that. I, nobody went out. And, but in boxing, that can happen often. And I said, you know, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. There's something very important about dropping your guard. You're going to put yourself in harm's way. If you're not careful as a Christian and you drop your guard and you take on anxiety or worry or dread or fear, you're going to put yourself in harm's way. Because you dropped your guard. It's so easy to drop your guard because there's lots of stuff going on all the time. Stuff at home, stuff at work, stuff in your neighborhood, stuff with your neighbors. Yeah. There's stuff going on and you could get anxious and worried and upset and, dis and, and feel dreadful. Yeah. But here's something very interesting. According to Psychology Magazine, it says, in 19, it says in 2019, that was just published, it said that 85% of all anxieties or fears, or worries, never happen. Wow. You mean to tell me that we're worried about stuff that isn't even going to happen anyway? Most of the time. I've got the biggest dread, the biggest, the biggest actually regret that I've ever had. I had to sit down this last week, as the Lord was saying to me, what's the biggest regret you ever face? What is the biggest regret in your life? And I sat there and I, I said, well, I'm pretty happy with my relationship with you and I'm pretty happy with my relationship with my wife and I love my relationship with the kids. But if I had to name one regret, it's that I worried over stuff that never happened. He said, that's the biggest regret most people have is that there's stuff that never happened they were fearful of. They regretted, they worried, they dreaded over. It didn't happen. Anxious means that you're having anxiety over threats that probably won't happen anyway. Amen. In Philippians 4 and 6, one more time, it says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Now, we take that as a suggestion. But it's a command. It's not one of the Ten Commandments, but it's a command. When that command came to us, I guarantee you, I don't care how holy you are, I don't care how spiritual you are, I don't care how much you come to church, I don't care how much you read your Bible, you probably did not fulfill that one at all. <laughs> Even though that command's in there, I guarantee you that the majority of people have not fulfilled that command. We've been worried, we've been dreadful, we've been fearful, we've been anxious about things. And the Lord said, don't worry about a thing. Don't let that stuff come on you. Don't let that stuff happen to you. Now, how do you know that? Ever, any time somebody has said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? That's a gauge to let you know you're worried about something. What are we going to do? Now, I don't, I don't think that just saying what are we going to do is going to be a problem. But I think when you repeat it, and you repeat it, and you repeat it, and it becomes infantium, and you get other people involved. What are we going to do? And that fret starts to come, and blood starts coming out of your foreheads. That's when you know you are really dealing with something. You're worrying about stuff that has not happened. Now, according to the Bible, you've been under some kind of a threat. Now, life is full of threats. Life's a threat itself. Anybody drive a car? Threat. 
<laughs> There's a threat of problems in the car. There's more threat in the problem of a car than there is in war most times. But this is something we need to understand. I had some folks come to me in, in just this few last, year, last few years, mostly relatives. And now these are distant relatives, but they're still relatives. And they said something like this. Well, do you know what your daddy died of? He's about your age, and he died. He had a coronary, and he's dead. You had to put him in a big old casket. He dead. He dead. And you know, because relatives are real gentle, you know, and they, they love on you and stuff. And, and relatives will be silly with you and get you and try to get you into worry. I had one relative tell me, you need to be worried about that. You ought to worry about that. You ought to worry about And they said it about four times. And I said, you know, the Bible says not to worry, not to be anxious, not to be fearful. And I think this is what you're trying to help me get into is the fearfulness. God said, don't do it. So you're doing something that God said not to do. So it's not helping God. It's hurting God's cause. And they thought I was being uh, sinister against them because I was judgmental. I wasn't judging. They'd already judged it themselves. There's all kinds of stuff to be concerned about. I had people come to me in the last few years. One lady said, what would I ever do if, if he leaves me? Oh, oh, my life would be over if he ever left me. I said, is there a problem at home? No. Is there a problem in your relationship? No. Do you have difficulty talking to each other? No. But oh, I'm worried he might leave me. I said, honey, stop it. <laughs> Because to let that thought keep going on, you're going to just bring on what you're worried about. The stuff that you worry most about is going to show up. Amen. And there's thousands of reasons every day for us to be anxious or have anxiety about stuff that hadn't happened. In 1 Peter, it says in chapter 5 and verse 7, 1 Peter, it says, Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Cast your anxieties. Now, one thing I can tell you, is our grandmas didn't take the nearly the medication that we take today. Now, why am I saying it like that? Because we got pills for everything. We got pills to help get up. We got pills to help lay down. We got pills, we got pills to make you feel good. Come on, we got pills to, to take away all nervousness. We got pills. We got all kinds of pills. And we pop them pills. Come on, anybody have neighbors? Yeah, you pop them pills because you're dealing with stuff. And when you're taking them pills, if you got, come on, anybody got kids? Yeah, you pop twice as fast. You pop them pills because when you're popping them pills, they're supposed to help you make, make you feel calm. And we got all kinds of pills, and, and including happy pills. Some of you here today probably have happy pills in your purse. I'm just saying. Because them happy pills is what makes... And listen, our society has turned into something that you wouldn't believe. We've turned to pills more than we turn to God. Grandma wouldn't deal with that kind of stuff. Now, the Bible's very clear. It gives us a prescription exactly what we're supposed to do anytime we have anxiety. It tells us exactly what to do. Now, we can have this prescription with no side effects. Anybody ever taken one of those cartons and looked at it, read the side effects? I got real thrilled the other day. I decided, well, you know, they got them nervous pills. You're supposed to take tough for them nervous pills. What does it make you do? You know, could it, could it possibly cause any problem? So I wrote down a couple of things. It said, it says, take one of our pills and you won't be nervous about anything. And then it went on. It said, now you may start hemorrhaging out of your eyes. You might have trouble breathing. It's been attributed to cancer, and in rare causes, it's caused death, but you won't be nervous. <laughs> I said, Lord Jesus, I think I'd rather have a little bit of shaking going on, you know? I, said, I, I don't want that kind of a dreadful thing on me. I don't like the think. I don't like the thought of it. I don't like any of that stuff. I want to have anything rather than bleed out of my eye. I mean, I, I don't want to deal with this stuff. 
<laughs> Let me be okay. But Jesus gave us a prescription. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, it says it like this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. He tells us exactly what to do and what's going to happen when we take it. Amen. He said, this is what's going to happen. I promise you, here's a prescription. Now, write this down. Here's the prescription. You read it in the Word, but you need to hear it simply. Number one, here's the prescription. Have a prayer life. That's the first part. Have a prayer life. Many Christians say, oh yeah, I got a prayer life. Really? Yeah, yeah, I got a prayer life. You know, prayer is God's plan to communicate with him. When people say, oh yeah, I got a prayer life, I got a prayer life. Most times they got a prayer life. They say, well, I've got 10 years worth of prayer. They don't even have one month worth of prayer 10 years over. God wants you to get a prayer life that has matured. Any of you talk just like you did when you were a baby? We'll probably have to get you a jacket and put you somewhere in a chair later on to eat. But, <laughs> but if you talk like you did when you was a baby, people are going to notice. But some people pray like that. They pray like this. You ready? Some people pray like this. Because they're doing it for show. So they pray, oh, omnipotent God. One that's in the universe that separates the night from the day. The Lord God that made the stars and made the heavens and made the universe. You are so omnipotent. You're so wonderful. You're so great. Hallelujah. <laughs> I've never heard a prayer yet. I mean, you're praising him, but I haven't heard the prayer yet. So I'm concerned when people make that kind of a boisterous prayer if they even know God. Because they're doing it to make a show for somebody else. When I go to God, I bow my head. I come before him. I mean... He said come boldly, but there's times when I, I, I know his presence is so vital that I'm so little in significance to him, and I want him to know that. He has to tell me, raise up your head. Get up off your knee. He'll have to tell me. But the Bible says come before him boldly. Now there's a way. According to the word, if you wait till you're in a fight, to get ready for the fight, you already lost. You're not going to make it anywhere. You've got to anticipate the punch before the punch is thrown. Amen. According to 1 John 15, or chapter 5 and verse 14, 1 John 5, 14, it says, This is the confidence that we have when we approach God. If we ask anything according to his will, now, some people need to underline that part. If we ask anything according to his will, now that's the stuff that's in the Bible. That's, that's why this is called a New Testament and an Old Testament. Because when God gave us this word, it's his last testament to us. And we're supposed to signify the testament or the last words of God. They are his will. That's the will of the Father. And we need to highlight that. Anything we ask according to his will, he hears us. According to 1 John 5 and 14. And if we know that he hears us, then we know we have the things we asked from him. Yes. Amen. Amen. Now this is what God wants us to do. He says you need to make your requests known to me. Not on Facebook. Not on Twitter. Not tell enough people what your problem is, then hope that somebody comes to your rescue. That's not faith. Faith is when you pray unto God and God talks to somebody and makes them give to you. Or makes them help you. Not because you were putting on that puppy dog face and hoping they would hear you. Come on. God's trying to help you get somewhere. In Matthew 6, I believe it's around verse 6, he says it like this. When you pray unto the Father in secret, he will re reward you openly. 
We need to pray in a way that God hears us. Not with that fluffy prayer that people try to pray. I'm talking about a prayer from the heart. And when you don't know how to pray, the Bible says, I'll show you how to pray. Some people say, I don't know how to pray. Well, the Bible is real clear. It says, what do you do when you don't know how to pray? Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. It says, here's what you do when you don't know how to pray. Likewise, the Spirit himself helps us in our weaknesses. For when we do not know how to pray as we ought, it says the Holy Spirit himself will intercede for us with groanings too deep for words. He will pray a prayer through us. That's the Spirit of the Lord. He promised that. He would do that. I'm going to tell you, sometimes I prayed and prayed, and I pray this for you. Oh, God, stop the bleeding and bring us into peace in Jesus' name. We need some peace, and most of that peace will come to you when you don't know how to pray as you ought. You need to pray them secret prayers. I'm talking about prayers in the Spirit unto the Lord. And then number two, I told you number one, but number two, be thankful, be thankful, be thankful. You know what most Christians' problem is? They're not thankful. You can give a kid, my mother told me this. She said, I could give you $100 and you wouldn't be happy. I said, why? She said, you'd want 110. <laughs> well, my mother couldn't give me $100. She couldn't even give me the 10. <laughs> I'd have been happy with one if I'd have just got one. <laughs> There's a reason that we are unthankful. We're a society that's built on the culture of not saying thank you often enough. We don't say please and thank you as a normal conversation anymore. You walk into a place to buy something and people will ignore you. I went into the mall with a shopping list, walked in with a full list, walked up to the counter, and there were two girls standing behind the counter. They were talking to one another. And I walked up there. I'm at the cosmetic counter trying to buy some cologne for heaven's sake. These things are $50, $70 a piece. I got a list of about five of them, and I'm thinking, for heaven's sake, I'm going to spend three, four hundred dollars with you. Let's go, girls. Let's go. And so they kept talking to one another, and I'm holding this list up. I'm waving my list, and they keep talking to one another. And I said, excuse me. And one of them said, can you see we're talking here? That's about all I needed. I said, me and my list are going. I decided they're not getting cloned from that store. Amen. Amen. They just lost that sale. In fact, I've never seen them girls again. Probably lost their job. Because they were talking and not working. Now, we need to be thankful. Uh, They weren't thankful for their job. We need to be thankful. I'm talking about in a real thankful mood. We need to be thankful. Even when you can't see something's happening, you need to be thankful. Where we're unthankful is when we don't see it happening in our time frame. I prayed to get $100 by today. I did it yesterday. I prayed to get $100 by today. I didn't see my $100, so I'm not happy. And then we let everybody know. Our face is mad. Our attitude is angry. Our shoulders are down. Come on, somebody help me. What's a depressed person look like? They put their shoulders back, put a smile on their face. Come on, help me. What's a depressed person look like? They got their shoulders down. Well, they walk real fast or they, you know, somebody said, no, they kind of shuffle along. And what's their face look like? Yeah. We all know what a depressed person looks like. Okay, so stop it. <laughs> You don't have to walk around like that. Ain't nobody going to help you. you got to take your prayers and your requests and make them known unto God. And be thankful. And be thankful. You need to get in a thankful mood. Some of you should have got up this morning and said, Oh God, I thank you I got up. I thank you, dear Lord, that I can put my pants on by myself. <laughs> thank you, Jesus, I was able to brush my teeth. I'm my own, I got my own teeth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I brush my own teeth. Thank you, Jesus. Ooh, glory. And you none of it. How many walked to church today? Mm-hmm. How many said thank you from my car? I think we ought to be thankful for little things and big things. I think we need to be thankful, thankful, thankful. You know, just about every week, my wife and I stand in our house and we say, Lord God, I just thank you for our house. I thank you for our house. Some people say, well, you've had that thing a long time now. I'm still not done being thankful. Oh, my gosh. My Lord 
has given us something to be thankful for. We need to be in a thankful mood and genuinely thankful for the promises that he made to me are true. Sometimes we hear the promises of God and just like I heard this morning, well that must be for somebody else. I thank God they're healed. Hallelujah. I just don't know why I'm not healed. I thank God there's money out there. Some people got some money and I thank God they sold their house for a million dollars. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh bless them Lord. <laughs> I got nothing. And we're not thankful for what we've got. I'll tell you what, the Lord says, I want you to pray and be thankful. And then the peace of God, that's number three, the peace of God that passes understanding will come upon your heart and your mind. You know, you can't walk around with a clear mind and a clear heart until you walk in peace. Because you'll just walk in anxiousness. It says walk in peace. You'll walk in peace. I'm talking about a crazy peace. I'm talking about a kind of peace that's ridiculous peace. An insane peace. I'm talking about peace that comes up good under an assault. I'm talking about peace that can handle itself when it's being boxed out. I'm talking about a peace, a crazy peace, ridiculous peace, a peace that passes understanding, a peace that can take a punch. Amen. I'm talking about a peace. This is the kind of peace that's good up inside of the middle of a storm. This is a peace, a crazy peace, a breaking through peace, a peace of God. The kind of peace that says, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> You know, everybody wants to share good stuff with you, right, all the time? But that's what we want to believe. But most time people share stuff just to kind of get your goat. And so you got to have some peace. I mean, in other words, you still got to go to get God. Are you with me? You need some peace. You need some peace. The peace of God that passes understanding shall guard your heart and your mind. It puts a brigade around your heart and a brigade around your mind. It's the protector of your soul. When you're dealing with something, I'll tell you what, we need peace, peace, peace. We need peace to keep ourselves from being, from having so much vulnerability to who we are as a person. You know, we take everything personally. If there's a problem going on at the store, people start crying because they think the lights went out because they went there. You need some peace. We need, we need some peace. We need some creative peace. Now, I prayed to God that you get some creative peace. When I was praying over this, the Lord said specifically, pray for witty inventions. Some people in here have witty inventions inside of you. Millions of dollars have not come yet because the witty invention is still under anxiety. But when you get peace over that, it'll bring you millions of dollars. Anxiety. You need, to get, you need to get peace about concepts and ideas because when they come, when they come, it'll put you in a different place than where you are now in Jesus' name. Now, psychologists have said that anxiety is like a pilot that pilots a plane. And I read this in the same psychology magazine. I said, man, can you preach two things out of the same magazine? And psychologists say that people that deal with anxiety, it's like flying an airplane and not realizing that all your instruments are broken. So no matter where you fly, you still think you're too low to the ground. You think you have imminent crashing coming, it's going to be coming on you right away it, because your instruments are broken. Here's something interesting, write this down. Anxiety breaks your instruments. It makes you think you're about to crash. It makes you think you're going down. It makes you think you're about to die or something imminent is about to happen. It's disastrous because your instruments are broken because you're in anxiety. Yes. Amen. And the way to get out of that, the way to get out of that, according to the word, is to realize anxiety has broken your gauges and you can't trust your senses. Just because your senses lie to you and tell you you're in trouble doesn't mean you're in trouble. It just means your instruments are broken. Amen. Yeah. Now, according to the word, it's Isaiah 9, it's verse 6, and he says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful, and Counselor, and Mighty God, and Prince of peace 
Wait a minute. Prince of Peace? That's who our God is. That's who Jesus Christ is. He's the Prince of Peace. I think we ought to count on that. Because see, if the Prince of Peace is talking to us, things are different. When you see him get on the boat, and he's the Prince of Peace, I think you can get on the boat too. Are you with me? <laughs> he's the Prince of Peace. That's the Prince of Peace getting on the boat right there. If you can allow his influence to get inside of you, then he'll fix your gauges. And they won't be broken anymore. You got to rest in the fact that he is in you. Right. Amen. Right. You got to rest on the fact that he'll be with you to pass through the waters. He's with you. In the midst of a storm, he's with you. Amen. And Jesus got on the boat and he said to his disciples, Let us go to the other side. Yes. Now, there's a very interesting thing in that verse, in that very specific phrase that Jesus quoted, let us go to the other side. It's a statement of promise. If the Prince of Peace said, let us go to the other side, no matter what happens, no matter what comes up, no matter what it looks like, he's already said, let us go to the other side, we ought to go, okay, and not panic. Are you with me? He said, let's go to the other side. You're going to go through some stuff, yeah, but you're still going to get there. Now, here's something very important. You can't trust your gauges, but you're still going to get there. You may be betrayed, you might even be delayed, but you're still going to get there. You're still going to get there. Everybody say it with me. You're still going to get there. Amen. Now, if, you're, if your boat is docked, and they got it tied to the dock, when that boat is tied to the dock, you don't have to worry about storms. When your boat is tied to the dock, you don't worry about thunder, you're not worried about lightning, you're not worried about storms, you're not worried about anything because your boat is tied to the dock. But the moment you release your boat and you start at his word, heading to the other side, and the storm comes, you're still going to get there. <laughs> We need to hang on to the fact you're still going to get there. When the lightning comes, when it flashes, when the thunder is raining, I'm telling you what, when your company's downsizing and they're going to be working out of a closet and you're next, <laughs> you just got to believe you're still going to get there. When sickness comes on you and it's so vibrant, it's punching you with the hardest punch you ever believe, you ought to think this. The Word says in 1 Peter 2, 24, by His stripes I am healed. That was a word from the Lord to you. You're still going to get there. Amen. You're still going to get there. Now, where you are in a storm is displayed by your peace or your anxiousness. In a storm, you need peace, <laughs> not anxiousness. How many would agree? When you're going through it, you don't need the anxiousness. And now I'm, I'm concerned. How could Peter be panicked at this storm? Yeah. I, I, have you ever read about Peter? Yeah, Peter, according to the Bible, he got a word from the Lord, let us go to the other side. Right there, that should be firm enough. If you've ever got a word from the Lord, that should be firm enough. We get on to Peter about getting a word, but if you've ever read the Bible, you got a word from the Lord. Don't you dare panic. And Peter panics because the storms come. Now, wait, let me ask you a question. He owns a fleet of boats, fishing boats. Has he ever been in a storm before, you think? Yes. You think he ever knows what to do? Yes. Been through a storm, had many storms, been doing it all his life. He's probably faced a lot of storms. But this time, he's shocked. <laughs> he panicked. He goes running through the boat all the way to the back. Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care? We're going to drown. <laughs> you think he displayed faith in God or faith in the circumstances? The circumstances pretty much had the view at that time. Are you with me? You know, some people get concerned if God loves them 
while they're going through a storm. I've had people sit in front of me and say, I just can't, I'm going through so much, I'm going through so much. I don't think God loves me or I wouldn't be going through this much. Anybody married? Anybody ever been married? You ever go through anything? Yeah. Never question whether God loves you. <laughs> hey, it's not God that's messing us up. Are you with me? It's the devil's messing this stuff up. Jesus promised you're going to go to the other side. And in this, we need something. God's asking us, I need you to display some lightning love. Can you display for me a little, a little thunder love? Can you display for me a, you know, a little boat rocking love and, and a little stormy love? And this is what God wants us to show him. If we can prove to him that we love him, it's because we're obedient to his word. If he said go to the other side, then we shouldn't panic at all. And here's something. Can you keep your guard when you're under attack? Wow. Because anybody can dance as long as the moonlight's full and the music is right. <laughs> but you know, it's hard to pray <laughs> when you're up under a storm. I mean, it's hard to move right when the storm is coming, the lightning's coming, the thunder's coming, the rain's coming in the boat. It's hard. That kind of praise... When you're praising, no matter what the situation looks like, it really torments the devil. Because he's shooting his best shot and you won't give in. He says, wait a minute, you're not even giving. I'm throwing out great stuff at you. Can't you do this? Because the storms define your character. Our reaction in a crisis will show the depths of our love in our relationship towards God. Amen. Now, Peter was always calm and cool and collected with his boats before, but now all of a sudden he's in this storm and he's freaked out. He's panicked. He's running to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, don't you care? Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. I fly two or three times a year. I love to fly. I, I love to drive. I love to fly. Get on the plane. Man, I I'm, I'm peaceful. My wife will tell you, I get on the plane. I don't have any trouble. And the plan, you know, there's some people grip, grip on that handle, you know, until their skin turns another color. You know, not me. I get on the plane, <clears throat> I'm out. Because <laughs> I'm asking for the peace of God to come on me. I'm sleeping through it. I'm, that's, that's just the way it goes. But I get on that plane. You know, one time I was flying, and I was going across country, and flying on this plane, and we hit an air pocket. Now, now it's not an air slit. Now, there's the difference. Air slits when you kind of move a little bit. Air pockets when you drop 20 feet or more. And that plane went down. Everything started rolling around. I mean, top trays were opening up. Stuff was falling out. Now, my gauge for a problem situation in the air is the flight attendant. Now, I look up there. If that flight attendant has not changed their facial expression... They didn't turn into a white sheet. <laughs> I, can't, I, I keep eating my peanuts. <laughs> I'm okay. But if they turn into a problem and everything starts to go nuts and, they, and they're grabbing on and they're buckling in and they're, they're trying to get everything out of the aisle, Houston, we have a problem. Because <laughs> I, I, I gauge all that's happening by the flight attendant because they're in charge. You would think... You would think that we would learn to look for a problem by what we've seen. Now, Peter is trained for this kind of scenario. He's trained to deal with storms. He's trained to deal with problems. And so, leadership is always proven in a storm. If you've got a storm, usually you can nav uh, navigate the storm and get to the end. Peter's always navigated the storm before, thus he's still alive, right? So he's navigated the storm before. Now, if this is possible, and Jesus is in the back of the boat, according to other scriptures, and he's asleep. Now, he's asleep in the back of the boat. Peter leaves the navigation wheel, and he runs to the back of the boat, and he shakes Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care? We're about to drown. And he's in the back with his hand off the wheel. And he has dropped his guard. Wow. 
And God's saying to you, stop it. Don't fret. You may be tossed a little bit, but you're going to make it. You may have to be rocked a little bit, but you're going to make it. You will get through this. Don't forsake your posture or position that I've given you of protecting yourself. That is, don't be anxious for anything. It'll bring the peace of God. Don't you dare be anxious or panic. Don't dread or worry when you're under attack. You must trust the Lord. Then the enemy is going to take territory and he'll take stuff that was never intended for him to have. Don't drop your guard. In Luke 8 and 24, the first part says it like this. Luke 8 and 24. It says, so the disciples went back and woke up Jesus. And they said, Master, 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 don't you care? Don't you care? Don't you care we're going to drown? They dropped their guard over their heart and over their mind. And whenever you drop your guard, it makes you question God's love for you. It makes you question. Don't you care? Lord, are you going to love me through this storm? Lord, are you going to love me through this surgery? Lord, are you going to love me through this divorce? Lord, are you going to love me through this unemployment line? Really, we've got to make a decision. Quit being anxious. Don't worry. The storms are sent from the enemy just to make you question God's love. Storms will make you change your position in God. They'll make you quit displaying a protected, guarded place. Don't drop your guard. Don't drop your guard. And Peter Buck runs back there. I'm sure he says like this, Jesus, Jesus, how can you just lay there when we're dealing with this storm? How can you just lay there? You're all asleep and everything. Now here's how I look at it. Okay, you ready for this? It's my view. If Jesus is cool... <laughs> if he's laying back there <clears throat> I'm, I'm, if, he's, if Jesus is cool I'm okay we're probably going to be alright are you with me everything's going to be alright because I'm with the prince of peace okay I'm with the prince of peace I'm going to be okay Jesus is there Jesus has peace when Peter has none now how did Jesus have peace look at look at Luke it says in verse eight, or chapter 8 and verse 24, the last part, it says it like this. With great authority, Jesus rebuked the howling wind and the surging waves. And instantly they stopped and became smooth as glass. Now let me explain something. Jesus kept his peace because he could change the circumstances in the midst of an assault. Because he did not drop his guard. He was not anxious about anything. He was not nervous about anything. He was not fretful about anything. And so the situation had to change because his trust was still in God. And he spoke to that thing and the thing had to obey him. Jesus will not join you in your hysteria. I don't care how panicked you get, Jesus goes, can't do anything yet until you display a little faith. Use a little faith, I'll get out of this. Now, the Bible very clearly says in John 14, 27, it says, peace, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you, give I it to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't be anxious, don't be worried, don't be fretful. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't be nervous, don't be afraid. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. This is my word to you. Don't be afraid, don't be worried, don't be anxious. Anxiousness and worry is just prolonged fear. People say, well, aren't you worried? No, I got crazy peace. Well, you must be insane if you're not, if you're not getting worried about that. Yeah, it's insane peace. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Don't worry. Don't fret. Don't pop pills to get out of it. Are you with me? Stay right with God. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he does not take any variable of things being under control or working right before he comes in line with the Word of God. He always says the word because the word and he are one. 
In Luke 8 and 25 it says it like this. Jesus said to them, why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? Have you lost your faith in me? And shocked and shaken, they said with amazement one to another, Who is this man? What manner of man is this that he has authority over the winds and the waves and they obey him? Now, here's the best part. I want you to catch this. It's not what he spoke to that was so powerful. It's where he spoke from that's so powerful. He spoke to an anxious, nasty wind and wave, a swirling storm, from a position of peace. And it had to obey him. Because you can't go out and look at a storm and go, Oh gosh, oh gosh, I pray you stop in the name of Jesus. Oh, please stop it. All it does is make you a fearful storm watcher. <laughs> You'll not move anything because the storm is in you. Amen. Now you can't speak outward peace from a place of inward turmoil. The worst storm is not on the outside. It's the one you allow on the inside. You need to prepare to speak from a reservoir of peace. He said, my peace I give you. My peace. Not like the world gives. Is the peace I give you. I don't want your heart to be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. I give you peace, peace. But you need to speak from that peaceful reservoir. That peaceful reservoir. That place of God. You need to speak from an active prayer life. One that's not just boisterous. But a real prayer life that's unto God. And he knows you. A prayer life. You need to speak out God's word. Some people say, well, why do you need to know God's word? Because the Bible says you be transformed by the renewing of the word of God in your life. You become a whole different person in your heart and in your mind by the word of God. And you speak from a place of peace because you know the word. Amen. And you speak from what my God can do. I know what my God can do. You need to know what your God can do. <laughs> Because when you know what your God can do, you're a whole different person. When you know he stands up and rebukes the winds and waves, and he says, and that everything I do, you can do and even more, because I go to be with my Father. When you rebuke the winds and waves, as the hurricane comes towards you, you say, you just better get out of here and go another direction. And the things split and go another way. I can tell you it's, it'll work. I was there. Some people say, well, I, how can you say that? Here's what I know. A ship never goes down from the water that's around it. A ship will always go down from the water that's in it. You need to be in a place of peace so that when he starts to box on you, you go, now you better kill me with the first punch because if I get up, it's all over. God's given you a great spirit. And the Bible says when you've done all to stand, then stand. I will not, I shall not, I must not drop my guard. Drop my guard. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the word today will penetrate our heart. That we will not let ourselves drop our guard. It's so easy for our guard to come down and be fearful. For our guard to come down and worry about something. Father, we speak more often about worry things. That's never going to happen. We're anxious and worried about many things. Father, I pray that we are penetrated by your love. And we take a position of not letting our guard down. So that the very things of this world will not affect us in that manner. And we walk around in peace. The peace of God that passes understanding. It quickens our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And we stop the very thing that comes to us. And is 
clear as glass. It flows easy. It's just crystal clear. And then it stops. And I give you praise, Lord, for helping us in Jesus' name. Today, listen to me. Listen to me. You may say, you know, I don't know Christ as my Savior. I don't know him as my Lord. But I want to know this Prince of Peace. I want to know how to walk in peace in the midst of a storm. I want to have the fullness of my life ready and settled in peace. I want him in my life. You may not know how to pray. You may not know how to supplicate. You may not know how to give thanksgiving unto God. But you say, "Ah, Pastor, pray for me. I want to know him today. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand and tell me you want to receive Christ. This is your first time you want to receive Christ as your Savior today. I'm going to pray for you. You can receive Christ. Let me give you a second invitation. Somebody would say, you know, I still catch myself often in worry or anxiousness or nervousness about things. And I don't want that to be on me anymore. Some of you say, I, I need to put myself in a different position. To put my guard up. I want God to quicken me in my heart and mind. So I want to be covered and not have anxiousness in my life anymore. If you want to be in a place to rededicate your life to God. So that your prayers become effective. And your thanksgiving unto God becomes a worthy praise unto Him. And be covered with peace that passes understanding. I want you to raise your hand because we're going to pray for you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus, for those that would say, help me, Lord. I want to give myself over to you. I want to rededicate myself to you in, in this manner. That I have an active prayer life. More than that. I learn about thanksgiving. My life becomes well with you. And I want that peace of God that passes my understanding to come on me and, and help me. And quicken my heart and quicken my mind so that nothing can affect me. I'll be covered with that. And I give you praise, Lord, that this mountain is moved and I walk in peace. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name.